Good afternoon. My name is Tanya Lakat, and on behalf of the entire Theorizing the Web organizing committee, I'd like to welcome you to today's episode of Theorizing the Web Presents, Age Against the Machine. Theorizing the Web Presents is our series of talks about technology and society. New episodes stream live every other Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and this is our second to last episode. If you'd like to discuss today's episode as it happens or submit questions for Q&A, please join us in the TTW Discord. You can find the Discord back channel by following the link in the description of this YouTube video and on our website, theorizingtheweb.org. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the production team at Museum of the Moving Image, without whom Theorizing the Web Presents truly would not be possible. I'd also like to thank my fellow organizing committee members, as well as all three of today's panelists. And on behalf of all of us, we'd like to thank you for watching and participating. If you like today's talk and want to see more, please consider making a donation to both Theorizing the Web and the Museum of the Moving Image. Every donation helps us to produce content like this, and we're grateful that we can do that with you. And with that, I'll turn it over to today's moderator, Whitney Aaron Basil. Whitney is an independent researcher and freelance editor whose work focuses primarily on the sociology of health, medicine, and technology. Her writing has appeared in Time, The New Inquiry, Cybergology, and Huffington Post. She is also the producer for Theorizing the Web Presents. Thanks, Whitney. Thank you so much, Tanya. So today's episode of Theorizing the Web Presents considers some of the misfits and outliers who trouble dominant ways of being and doing on the internet. Across three papers, <clears throat> we'll use queer theory to problematize algorithms and algorithmic power, we will ask why vinyl records are having a new heyday in an age of ubiquitous music streaming services. <clears throat> and finally, we will ask what it means to be old on an internet where accessibility is an unglamorous afterthought and personalization means incessant reminders of mortality, decay, infirmity, accident, painful illness, and utter irrelevance. Our first speakers are Sonia Solomon and Victoria Simon. Sonia Solomon is research director at the Center for Media, Technology and Democracy at McGill University and a co-founder of the Coalition for Critical Technology. She is currently completing her PhD in the Department of Communication Studies at McGill. Sonia works on the histories and politics of platforms and the social implications of AI. Victoria Simon is a professorial lecturer in the School of Communication at American University. She examines the history and cultural politics of technological interfaces and software industries, drawing lines between the practices of developers, identity, disability, and democracy. She has a special focus on music and sound and is currently working on her first book manuscript titled From Difficulty to Delight, an Archaeology of Musical Screens. And with that, I will turn it over to Sonia and Victoria. Um, <clears throat> okay. okay, um, just waiting for, for it. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Victoria Simon and I'm a professor this year at American University. And I'll be presenting with Sonia Salamoon and we are really grateful to Theorizing the Web for putting on this panel. I'm currently writing my first book based on my dissertation, which reimagines the insistence on positivity, pleasure, and human perfectibility in platforms and software industries. Um, and I do this through the, through the critical lens of queer theory and disability studies. So today, Sonia and I will unpack the insistence on a positive emotion and feeling good embedded in the design of recommendation and matching algorithms. And as queer scholars working on the politics of histories of digital media, our goal today is to use queer theory to rethink some ground truths and algorithmic logics and their core assumptions about feeling good online. So recommendation system algorithms determine what is placed in front of you on platforms, as well as what content to omit. These algorithms attempt to create a semblance of a stable identity that is presented to us in a recognizable form and to make who we are and our preferences legible. So Sonia and I will argue against the impetus to collect a coherent picture of who we are through more data points 
and to dismantle the system of ordering our identities altogether. What we will argue is that queer theory can produce a different set of questions about what algorithms afford us and ways to disarticulate algorithmic logics. We will use the examples of the dating app Hinge, the music platform Spotify, and the video content sharing app called TikTok to illustrate our ideas. And finally, we will gesture towards what a queer orientation to recommendation algorithms might look like. So before we dive into our examples, I'm going to give a brief overly simplified view of queer theory. The term queer was originally a pejorative term to mean that someone was strange or odd. And in 1989, activists began, began to reclaim the term. So rather than queer being an insult, queer became this overarching term to speak about the spectrum of sexual orientation and gender. And it's important to note that queer subjectivity and queer theory is not a monolithic subject and often queer theorists analyze different forms of queer experience. And what tends to unite queer theory is the insistence of the fluidity of sexual orientation and gender and the permeability of identity. It's the notion that identity and orientation are not fixed stable categories. And an important term to note here is heteronormativity, which is the ideology that heterosexuality is the normal and natural sexuality. More generally, queer theory is a field that resists this normative model of stability and the construction of the nuclear family as the ideal form of, quote, the good life, and analyzes the incoherence around sex, gender, and desire. So for example, queer theorists such as Lee Edelman and Lauren Berlant articulate how negative affect may pave the way for resistance and refusal that questions the norm of, quote, the good life. And Jack Halberstam's theory of queer failure articulates how failure paves the way for discovery of alternative experiences. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Sonia, who's going to talk to you about how queer theory relates to algorithms and specifically in the dating app Hinge. Then I'm going to uh, speak about queer theory in relation to Spotify. And finally, finally, we will use the example of TikTok as a way companies attempt to redress the issues that we speak about. Thanks, Victoria. So algorithms are typically understood as the coded instructions that a computer follows to perform and execute tasks. And algorithms are deployed to sort and make visible the vast amounts of data circulating online. Uh, but when we talk about algorithms, I think it's important to note a few things. Um, one, they're not just one stable kind of a thing. They're always part of broader socio-technical assemblages and through them, they make decisions that subtly yet powerfully reshape daily life and online interactions. So importantly, algorithms are also prefigured by and embedded within longer systems of classification and are reshaped by their designers, by users and by the broader imaginaries of their use. So in short, they're complicated. Um, so in the simplest definition, algorithms make decisions toward a given output, right? So in that pursuit, they make certain choices that select, rank, make visible certain connections or patterns in our data over others. And consumer recommendations are often customized to keep us engaged with a service or platform for as long as possible, um, often through the promise of personalization. So algorithms, especially recommendation algorithms, purport to know us better than we know ourselves. And ironically, not because we stand out, but by erasing the differences between us by clustering us into groups based on how like and unlike we are from others in our networked neighborhoods. And this is precisely because homophily, the common idea that birds of a feather flock together is a default assumption that grounds algorithms and collaborative filtering online as media theorist Wendy Chen's work has shown. So, this brings up several discriminatory outcomes, right? Um, algorithms can create narrow filter bubbles of self-reified views, which are overly simplistic and deterministic accounts of personal preferences, of our tastes um, and desires. So in so doing, they naturalize the very process of ordering that they rely on. Um, and as many scholars have shown, filter bubbles are not simply a natural outcome but are the goal of systems seeking to identify patterns. 
And in this way, algorithmic recommendations disavow certain queer logics like unpredictability and vulnerability as alternate connections and ways of engaging with technological systems. So in short, algorithmic techniques perform and enact a universalized image of what Sarah Ahmed calls the politics of feeling good. So by disavowing unwanted outcomes or mistakes that may otherwise invite generative queer logics of disappointment and vulnerability, as I mentioned. And so one area where we kind of see these tensions and logics um, at play is dating apps and matching algorithms which are clearly not exempt from the recent influx of algorithmic discrimination and bias, um, often across intersections of race, class, gender, and evolving sexual orientation, as Jevin Hudson and other scholars have shown. So online dating often shores up how broader and longer social biases are bound up with our intimate daily lives. And this is perhaps unsurprising when read against the longer history of computerized dating services, whose purpose in the 60s and 70s was to replicate and strengthen an existing heteronormative social patterns and hierarchies, as Mara Hicks has shown in their work on early computer dating. And indeed, many of the core logics of contemporary networks um, and, and data structures more broadly, so the concept of neighbors and friends, uh, of attraction based on homophily or, or this assumption that like attracts like, um, which is a foundational concept in network science, they're all echoed in these early histories of computer dating. And so contemporary dating apps um, are, are not that different, right? They often reinstate these logics. So Hinge as one example, a dating app owned by Match Group that combines machine learning with a matching algorithm to recommend a daily most compatible match. Um, and Hinge allegedly differs from other dating apps because it solves the problem of endless choice or the too many fish in the sea scenario. And the way that Hinge does this is through a most compatible match feature, right? So that this is based on several factors like uh, your profile info, the prompts or survey questions that we fill out on the app and our previous likes. And Hinge then uses this algorithm to show you the people that you're most likely to want to go on a date with, but importantly, who are most likely to go on a date with you. And so this specific algorithm called the Gale Shapley algorithm is their way of solving what is commonly known in mathematics and economics as the stable marriage problem. And this was developed, the algorithm was developed in 1962 as a means of ensuring optimal matching between two sets of elements. So the algorithm means pairing people with partners that they most prefer and ensuring that in a large, even pool of single people, everyone will be matched. So for example, in a group evenly divided into men and women, the algorithm traditionally has individuals rank potential partners uh, by level of preference. And then it cycles through different rounds of proposals and rejections until each individual is then paired with who they prefer most, um, given that they're not already taken or quote, engaged. So the ideal end outcome here is that no two members would prefer another match over their current pairing. And while that might sound complicated, it might actually just be the premise of Love Island, uh, which is a popular online uh, or popular reality dating show. And so there's clear assumptions at play here about feeling good, about comfort and stability um, and desire that I think we can think through with queer theory. Um, so the Gale Shapley algorithm only makes sense if we assume universal monogamy. And since matching algorithms are at their core about optimization, um, here the most positive outcome, monogamy, is ideally the most stable and comfortable one for all. And ultimately, comfort invites a normative version of pleasure. So one that is goal oriented and one that affirms um, our, our identity and our worldview back to us. So in this way, we have our most comfortable past 
uh, made up of previous connections, desires, swipes, affinities, and, and romantic partners affirmed back to us in a potential future match. And this is really the core of network homophily or clustering, or in this case, matching, um, like with like. So which as Wendy Chin argues, serves to quote, launder hate into collective love, thereby naturalizing discrimination in the name of quote, comfort, predictab predictability, and common sense. So discomfort by contrast, offers a different way to think about norms. So for Sarah Ahmed, queerness may not necessarily be about assimilation or resistance, but is rather an inability to be comfortable in certain norms. So departing from this, how do we use instances or evidence of heteronormative bias to invite other more uncomfortable logics, such as queer failure, discomfort, and negative affect? in order to ultimately reclaim the kinds of problems that algorithms are purported to solve. And so with that, I will hand it back to Victoria, who is going to discuss how this logic extends to music apps. So as stated by the company, the goal of Spotify's recommendation algorithm is to give you the perfect song for the perfect moment just for you. And an advertisement for the platform states, we only ever recommend music we think listeners will want to hear. And what I will subsequently argue here is that in their present form, these algorithms disavow a queer orientation. They delimit the joy of going astray, of getting lost and decentering our perspective within the overriding goal of making a person, quote, feel good. And as you see, there are these numerous data points that go into deciding what the person encounters. And some of these factors are the songs you have on repeat, time of day that you listen, and listening habits of people with similar tastes. So in regards to the algorithm, a blogger named Kieran writes, the algorithm makes him feel seen. He is constantly delighted by how satisfying and just right it is every week. And what is interesting to me about this quote is that it speaks to the fact that Kieran recognizes himself in the music recommendations. The stream of music that is meant just for him performs a kind of identity work. It reflects and it affirms his identity back to him within a specific time-based context. And moreover, like many other consumers who use Spotify, Kieran positions himself as an effective, desiring, pleasure-seeking body. And what we know from Spotify recommendation algorithms is that it does indeed seek to maximize these positive feelings and regulate the person's mood. So as the writers of the book Spotify Teardown point, Teardown point out, the imperative to be comfortable and happy with what you hear ex extends to Spotify's mood regulating playlists. Spotify provides curated playlists to enhance users' mood and promote these positive feelings of well-being. So if you look at the playlist presented under the category of mood, we see titles like mood boosters, have a great day, confidence boost, good vibes, happy hits, and the list goes on. And here you can see that Spotify effectively normalizes pleasure as positive affect. So algorithms stay with the person as a way to increase their positive orientation to the world and enhance their productivity throughout the day. And, I'm trying, and in trying to produce these quote, happy users, the musical recommendation system disavows feelings of discomfort, such as challenge, irritation, difficulty, or annoyance. The goal here is to affirm the person's taste and to make them feel good, and ultimately to mitigate the experience of listening to unwanted content. So as we've been discussing here, pleasure is political. As Jack Halberstam writes, disorientation, the place of desolation, is a form of queer pleasure. A queer moment involves the quote, intellectual experience of disorder and queerness involves the joy and the excitement in these moments. The insistence on a positively charged emotion in Spotify contravenes these queer counter normative pleasures. And of course, not everybody receives pleasure from the same thing. And instant gratification, should be, we should note, is really only one way of experiencing pleasure. So embracing these negative affects such as disillusionment, disappointment, disorientation can be thought of as one way of being queer. 
And it provides a space to discover, as Jack Halberson would perhaps say, these alternatives to entrenched norms. So this counters the goal of these algorithms, which is really just to know you and make your identity and preferences more legible. And so now this brings us to TikTok. Um, TikTok is an app that is used a lot with uh, people in the Gen Z generation. Um, and it is, user, it is user generated video content system. So the algorithm in TikTok presents users with this hope and promise that they will receive content that's catered just to them. Um, and that is of course, once they uh, spend enough time on the app and that they will be presented with these new gratifying positive experiences. So if we look at this in terms of affect, the app promises the delight and positivity the algorithm will afford us in this sort of endless stream of um, seamless experience of content that's made just for us. Um, <clears throat> so recently, TikTok has received criticism for amplifying filter bubbles such that if you click on a particular content creator, you will receive content of people who look the same. And um, TikTok actually claims to redress this issue with the filter bubble through interruption and diversification. And they say that they intersperse diverse content into the user's feed. This purportedly improves algorithms, this purportedly improved algorithm rather, allows the user to quote, stumble upon and discover new content and to quote, explore experiences you might not otherwise see. However, in my interviews with TikTok users, they claim that as you use the app, it gets less and less diverse. Um, thin white straight people get pushed to the top. And as one user notes, popular creators fitting into quote, straight TikTok favor white, cisgendered, heterosexual, slim, skinny, and able-bodied creators. And many TikTok users critique the experience of the marginalization they experience in, in the TikTok platform. So to briefly wrap up, uh, I think we'll end off by, by asking, open, opening it up to what if instead of opting for algorithms that better or further organize or collate and create these uninterrupted connections, we called for algorithms that produce the space for modes of unknowing and uh, algorithms that fail to map our relations and algorithms that instead expose the seams of our identity. And so we invite reimagining how to use queer theory to undo the immutability of the past. And according to the late legal and critical race scholar, Derek A. Bell, to see things as they really are, you must imagine them for what they might be. So for some queer theorists um, like Lee Edelman, that may not require calling for an entirely new politics or a brighter tomorrow, as these fantasies would inevitably reproduce the past. And so what if we approached the past not as corralled neighbors in online clusters, but as queer strangers who embrace discomfort over an, ins an insistence uh, to constantly perform and repeat the politics of feeling good. So thanks everyone for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia and Victoria. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Jack Webster. Jack is a graduate of the Web Science Center for Doctoral Training at the University of Southampton, UK. He is interested in how platformization is shaping the production and consumption of cultural goods. All you, Jack. Thank you. So thank you to the Theorizing the Web organizers and to, for making these events happen, despite the circumstances. And I'm today gonna to be talking about uh, the kind of vinyl music revival and specifically arguing that it's a privileged response to the, what I call the accelerated availability of recorded music in the streaming age. So despite the affordable, abundant and personalized access to music offered by music streaming platforms, such as Spotify and Apple Music, vinyl music consumption has experienced a resurgence in recent years. 
For example, in the UK, between 2014 and 2018, vinyl revel, rev revenue increased by approximately 300% from $25.8 million to $76.1 million. Yet why, in an age of abundant and affordable access to music, are some people willing to pay a premium to own and consume music in physical formats? In this talk, I suggest that the recent vinyl revival is, at least in part, a privileged response to the accelerated availability of music in the streaming age. So going back a little way now, the pioneering works of Simmel, Veblen, and Bourdieu have demonstrated that the consumption of cultural goods is an important part of how people communicate characteristics such as class, status, and individuality. In particular, they highlight the importance of time access to disposable time and the conspicuous use of it is traditionally seen as a marker of class privilege as it signals to others one's need to not work or attend to the immediate needs of the body. Of course, at their time of writing, the performance of identities and distinction would have occurred through the consumption of physical goods and artifacts. But today, digital technologies, the internet and the web have created new opportunities for people to communicate status. Yet, I argue today that the intense rate and scale at which new music is made available by streaming platforms through mechanisms such as personalization, and that this is undermining opportunities to take time to appreciate music for its own sake, an important part of how some people seek to achieve distinction through music taste and consumption. As a result, some individuals have returned to the consumption of physical formats as a way to reclaim the time and space needed to appreciate music in this way, finding a new yet old arena to pursue social distinction. So what I'm gonna be talking about today are findings that draw from my PhD research completed in 2019, which drew on a combination of semi-structured interviews with music industry key informants and Spotify users, and more broadly, it examined how streaming platforms are shaping the part that music taste and consumption plays in the performance of class distinction. And this theme around vinyl and, the, and the, the temporal dynamics of consumption is one of the findings from that work, but there are other things that you can also check out. So existing literature has begun to explore why vinyl has experienced a resurgence in recent years. The vinyl revival is described as a way to communicate status and achieve autonomy from the corporate objectives of the recording music industry by turning to the past, incorporating outdated technologies into contemporary music consumption practices. For example, Hayes 2006 argues that secondhand vinyl collecting is a response to a postmodern malaise. Younger consumers are turning to vinyl and other outdated technologies to construct consumer identities that challenge the recording music industry's attempts to define and regulate consumer choices. Meanwhile, Magauda 2011 argues that in response to the digitalization of recorded music, materiality is biting back and younger consumers are celebrating the use of material artifacts, such as iPods and vinyl records, to reinstate a sense of cultural ownership in a context where recorded music is increasingly accessed and stored online in seemingly immaterial ways. However, I believe that there is more to this story. And today, I argue that the vinyl revival is also a privileged response to the accelerated availability of music in the streaming age. So to begin making this point, let's explore what I mean by the accelerated availability of music. So not only do music stream platforms offer on-demand access to music, and lots of it, they are actively seeking to shape what and how people engage with it. They are continuously anticipating what people want to consume next, curating content in the form of single item recommendations, promotions, and editorially curated and personalized playlists. I argue that in doing so, these platforms are accelerating the availability of music because of the pace and speed at which new music is presented to people. Apple Music's new music mix updates on a weekly basis, Spotify's daily mix playlists update on a daily basis, and both Apple and Spotify's personalized home pages update across the course of a day, responding to contextual cues such as the time of day and recent listening. 
the ephemeral experience of streaming music is, as I found in my research, a source of anxiety for some people, especially those who claims, whose claims to social distinction rest on their musical expertise and appreciation of music. As I go on to illustrate through the story of one of my participants, who I call Jamie, the vinyl revival is a way to reclaim the time and space needed to appreciate music for its own sake, renewing claims to distinction. So let's meet Jamie. Jamie is in his early 20s and works in social media marketing at a university. He studied philosophy and has lived a cosmopolitan life, growing up in a number of countries around the world. Jamie's music taste is omnivorous in nature, a mode of consumption commonly associated with privileged individuals and groups. He displays an assured handling of diverse musical styles. However, for him, it's not a free for all. Rather, he is quite discriminate and, and somewhat snobbish about what he chooses to consume, defining his taste in opposition to the bland and predictable nature of pop music. As you can read in this quote, the knowledge that pop music is by design intended for the lowest common denominator. It's got to appeal to as many people as possible, and the result doesn't have a lot of character. At the time of doing the interview, Jamie had been using Spotify for around a year, migrating from using SoundCloud and YouTube. Jamie's musical assurance extends to how he uses Spotify. Creating playlists on Spotify is a way for Jamie to display to others his musical expertise and familiarity with diverse musical styles. As he puts it, I get an immense amount of pleasure out of creating playlists. I take a lot of pride in finding the right situation for a playlist and then putting it on and seeing how people react to it. Personalization is a double-edged sword for Jamie. On the one hand, it's increased the rate and scale at which he discovers new music, allowing him to broaden his musical horizons and learn more about new music, especially if you think like Discover Weekly, which is great for him. But then on the other hand, uh, because streaming and personalization is accelerating the availability of music, Jamie feels that he's spending less time appreciating the music made available to him by Spotify, creating a kind of fear of missing out effect. This undermines the basis of his claims to social distinction and his comments here highlight the changing temporalities of music consumption in the streaming age. To quote him, I think it's affected the degree to which I will slow down and repeat listen to things. I'm not taking as much time to get to know a lot of the music I'm listening to because there's always something good as swipe or tap away. In contrast, vinyl music consumption represents a way to slow down the experience of consuming music for Jamie and reclaim the time needed to appreciate music for its own sake. The act of listening to music on vinyl is traditionally a slower and more deliberate practice. Like the convivial eating experiences promoted by the slow food movement, consuming music in physical formats can be a ritualistic experience involving finding, feeling, listening, and displaying music. Above all, it is a way of consuming music that emphasizes the importance of spending time, as Jamie's comments highlight here. With vinyl, it's, I bought this album because I specifically wanted to own it. I'm going to sit down and listen to this one album and focus on one single thing for a little while, which to me is a totally different experience. Jamie's story highlights how the vinyl revival can be seen as a, a privileged response to the ephemeral consumption experiences created by music streaming platforms. Jamie re redeploys his economic capital, spending disproportionately more money on vinyl than streaming to reclaim the time and space needed to display his musical appreciation and expertise. This allows Jamie to renew his claims to distinction and tactfully resist the dominance of music streaming platforms. Yet, yeah. This response to the changing speed at which music is made available is not shared by everyone and was kind of differentiated in the sample of people that I interviewed. Traditionally, record collecting, for example, is understood as a masculine practice marked by gendered stereotypes, such as the male obsessive compulsive collector. And this trope is represented in the sample of people I interviewed. For example, one of my participants, Deborah, dismisses vinyl music consumption and record collection based on gendered stereotypes. As she puts it, that's a boy thing. I've always said, what's the difference between train spotters, bird spotters, and music lovers? Not an awful lot. 
Furthermore, there are generational differences in the appeal of vinyl. For example, for Tracy, who's in her late 40s, who grew up listening to music on vinyl, the format holds little symbolic value. Tracy is more interested in the novelty of having access to vast catalogues of music on Spotify, rather than returning to the impracticalities of consuming music on vinyl. As she puts it in this quote, on Spotify, you can listen to music anywhere. We never had that before. There is nothing good about vinyl. My son loves vinyl. It's heavy. They break, they wear out, they crackle. So in summary, whilst the personalization performed by streaming platforms is accelerating the availability of recorded music, undermining opportunities to mobilize musical expertise in the pursuit of distinction, the vinyl revival represents an opportunity for privileged and invested individuals to reclaim the time and space needed to appreciate music for its own sake. Yet this renewed enthusiasm for physical formats is not shared by all. Rather, it's shaped by gendered and generational differences in music consumption practices, and it is a mode of consumption available to those with both disposable time and income to spend on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack. Finally, I would like to introduce our last speaker, Heather Fenby. Heather has choreographed and performed in dance and experimental theater pieces for 30 years. She also has a parallel career as a UX strategy consultant. Take it away, Heather. So uh, this is old on the web because I am old and I am on the web, but I'm not as old as the internet thinks I am, which creates this dizzying uh, experience of being hurtled toward death at warp speed. I remember exactly how it started. Uh, I was in a, a rocky relationship uh, in which my boyfriend was setting me ever higher hurdles uh, to fail at. And uh, it was in this spirit that he invited me to join Facebook. Um, now, I got like an email or a chat and it said something like, all my friends, uh, pestered me to get on this stupid platform. Now I'm connected to all these people I barely know and you're not here. So I had to create a Facebook account. So I go on there and they ask first thing for my real name. Now, I don't use my real name online. I made that choice very early to remain anonymous. I thought of it in terms of uh, the consolidated, consolidated self or distributed self. Consolidated self people wanted uh, everything to be under the umbrella of their name, their achievements, their accomplishments, their writings, their opinions. And this was a big deal in the, uh, in the 90s. Um, Jeanette Winterson, the novelist, uh, somebody took JeanetteWinterson.com, they squatted her name. She was, uh, went ballistic over this because she thought she was like the Jeanette Winter Winterson and she should have JeanetteWinterson.com. But distributed self people, they like to essentially be stealthy and dart hither and non, striking at will, commenting wherever. Um, and I was one of those people. But the conceit of Facebook was it would be your real friends, the real connections, real people, whatever. So I typed in my name. Then they wanted my birthday. Well, I, I'm not gonna give some random website my birthday. Uh, I had made many accounts and many of those services had already dis disappeared. So, um, you know, I wasn't gonna accommodate uh, or add to all the data broker um, sourced information already available on me. So I had to choose something I would remember. So I chose January 1st. And uh, then in a fit of pique against my partner and also against youth culture in general, um, because my boyfriend, my then boyfriend had always lied about his age. I don't know when he started, but he lied about his age when I met him. 
um, I uh, was ahead of the astrology curve. So I had created a birth chart, comparison charts, transits, angles, progressions. All of it was a lie. He had lied about his age. He always said he was five years younger than he was. So I just took the scroll bar uh, you know, on my computer and I went through the years and I scrolled and scrolled and scrolled and scrolled and scrolled and I hit 1929. And I never filled out any other profile information or gave Facebook a picture. So bathing I'm born January 1st, 1929. Now, um, a few, a, a while back, I saw this ad or like, it was like a promotional video for a instant loan app. And the deal was you put in absolutely minimal information and then their algorithm went out into the web and data brokers and various uh, sources and they got 5,000 points of data on you and they instantly gave you an interest rate. And if you uh, thought that was good, you hit accept and your bank account was instantly funded. Um, and one of the data points they used was the battery level on the phone you were applying from, because somebody decided that low battery people are less credit worthy. And this reminds me, and there have been many Twitter threads on this, this is a known thing, but both the information you choose to share and the information you choose to hide will be used against you in digital redlining. Say you are an incredibly healthy person and you are vegetarian, eat organic food, you shop at your local co-op, pay in cash. Your credit card you use for going out to bars with friends and um, for uh, you know junk food, drugstore, whatever. Well, your health insurance company, when they're setting your rate, they might go to your credit card company and they look at your purchase history and it looks like you're always drinking and eating junk food. The, a uh, healthy part of your life is hidden from the algorithms and in some sense does not count or in fact counts against you. Now I, uh, sorry, I keep looking at my notes, sorry. Um, I believe I have excellent digital hygiene. Um, I keep the location beacon on my phone turned to off, not per app, but just off, uh, which makes Google Maps extremely annoyed with me. They're like, uh, you know, turn location services on. Uh, you know, I just want to see a map. I don't want to see where I am. I know where I am. Just show me the map, you know? Um, I, I um, always, I will take any time in the world to hit, you know, go down in the privacy preferences, do not track, do not, no, no ad preferences, do not um, monetize, uh, do not follow around, no cookies, nothing. Um, I don't use a VPN, um, but I have a Google set to not uh, save my searches. Although I think they probably do save my searches, but if law enforcement came because I like murdered someone, they could not tell them about my searches because I said no. Um, and also, I have an extremely normal name. It's not exotic, it's just basic, but for some reason, it's also exceedingly rare. There are only, I believe, five of us on the planet. That means that if you type my name into Google, it's me, you get me. I am the person you get. But it's not me because it's only stuff that other people put under my name. I myself haven't put anything under my name. So you get the lowest of the low, you know, the, those websites that say, you know, don't you want to know more about this person? Maybe they committed a crime, you know? Uh, and uh, one of the first hits under my name is I once wrote an essay. Uh, someone took great exception to it. They wrote 
a long screed, badly written, missed the point. Uh, and that is like the second hit under my name. So that is the unintended consequences. That's the paradox of privacy, I would call it. The more you hide, the more the things, you, the less control you have. You, it seems like a control move, but the less control you have over how you're actually portrayed and seen. So as a result of having told Facebook that I was born in 1929, which who knew they would last, right? Who knew they would become the preeminent predatory platform for monetization of the self? Everything goes through them. They are the, they are the uh, arbiters of being. And so my experience of the internet is one of being a very old person. No matter the context, no matter what I'm reading, looking at, scrolling, I am served ads uh, for infirmity, uh, near death, uh, for estate planning, reverse mortgages, um, uh, burial plots, nursing homes, assistive technologies, uh, emergency buttons, um, uh, every possible disease you could imagine, along with illustrations and images that I cannot unsee, uh, you know, the more obscure and horrific, the, the more in your face. Uh, and because I'm a woman and it never ends, cradle to grave, uh, I am, uh, my, my anxiety about my waning attractiveness is uh, monetized back to me with fear mongering about perhaps, you know, I have creepy skin. Perhaps my upper arms are sagging and, and waving around in the wind. Perhaps I have age spots. Perhaps my lipstick is bleeding into my age line. You know, uh, uh, what, what horror, uh, you know, am I not paying enough attention to and paying enough money on? And, uh, This cannot be undone. I cannot go back in time and hit reset and play the internet as a different character, as a younger person. This is it forever until I die. And the internet is increasingly surprised that I'm not dead yet. Perhaps uh, one could just delete Facebook, uh, and then everything would be fine. But no, uh, you cannot unring the bell. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. Um, I watched all the Senate hearings with Mark Zuckerberg and uh, someone, you know, asked him about shadow profiles and he got to smirk and look, you know, oh, I don't know what that is because they don't call them shadow profiles, they call them unregistered users. Everyone in the world is an unregistered user. Um, it doesn't mean they're not collecting data on you, it just means when you create a Facebook account, all the data they've already collected is dumped onto your name to be monetized. So I believe that uh, digital privacy rights are the next frontier in civil liberties. Um, I think this is gonna be very big with Generation Z who have been tracked, like first their parents blogged about them and put their baby pictures up. And then as soon as they got into kindergarten, all sorts of predatory ed tech, uh, poor security, no, no choice. These are children, they cannot opt in. Uh, you know, tech illiterate educators looking for a cheap solution um, they've been signed up on many, many platforms that are tracking them, collating their information and selling it. And this is forever. It's like digital toilet paper on their shoe that's been like following them around. Um, I, I think they will become conscientious objectors to the surveillance state. This is being, uh, there, there are two instances that it's come to prominence. One is that everyone's worried about uh, teen suicides and 
school shooters and there have been pots of money for this, grants. So um, school boards will get pitched uh, from startups, you know, hey, we can solve that problem. All you have to do is like give us access to every student's laptop and cell phone. We'll run every single thing they do through our GWIZ algorithm. If it hits a red flag, it gets elevated to a person and then, you know, uh, we hit the alarm. Well, the, the people are essentially task rabbits. They get paid like $12 an hour. They have no expertise. And what you end up doing is criminalizing normal teen aunts. Like someone, the, the uh, example I read, someone was going through a breakup. They texted their friend, uh, by this time tomorrow, it will all be over. And then like a SWAT team showed up on their porch. Um, and then with COVID, now that everyone's studying at home, there have been absolutely horrific stories coming out about exam proctoring software, which essentially universities mandate that students turn their personal computers into spyware and they have to show their environment. They have to have set a baseline of their, of their uh, physical being. And then like any deviation is like called out as possible uh, cheating, which uh, there are, you know, what science is that possibly based on and how many privacy transgressions are in that? Uh, I think the ACL should, LU should get involved. I think uh, that should be completely illegal. So, Although I am old, and although I realized that I did this to myself by telling Facebook I was born in 1929, uh, it still gets to me. It, it, these these uh, ads play, play on, they prey on actual, actual losses and actual griefs and actual fears in the future. And it's very, uh, sub, it subconsciously gets to me. It makes me feel hustled toward the grave. Um, it makes me feel, uh, William Gibson quote, uh, the future is here, it's just unevenly distributed. It's like, I'm from the future, it's not very pleasant. Uh, you know, like I'm, I got there already. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there's this whole thing like your parents, are being radicalized by Facebook, they're being rad radicalized by Fox News. Maybe they're being radicalized by constant reminders of their own mortality every time they log on to a, uh, a, you know, a universe that was uh, designed for, created by, optimized for, speaks to young people, uh, specifically young men, uh, but young people writ large, and that sees them as expendable, irrelevant, uh, and it's worse with COVID because even my carefully curated Twitter feed, I'm, I'm extremely selective who I follow, little hints of eugenics are poking through, uh, you know, oh no, it's, uh, look at this chart, it's only people over 80 who died, oh, they lived their lives already, you know, they, they had a good time. Uh, why should the rest of us be inconvenienced for these old people, for these vulnerable people, for these completely, you know, you know, they're not the real people. They're not the default people. Um, when I was, uh, I grew up in the 70s. When I was seven, uh, m the people who were really old, had been born in the 1890s. But the images of them, the idea of them, what they wanted, the services they needed, the way they presented themselves, what we thought about them was exactly the same as now 50 years later. The idea of, of old people is ossified, it's cotton amber, um, it never changes. Uh, Everyone wants to di disrupt something. If you really want to disrupt something, how about disrupting elder ad tech? Because it's bottom of the barrel. In the same way that accessibility is bottom of the barrel 
less prestigious UX work. Uh, ads for old people use uh, stereotypes, default, uh, you know, it's just in the way with architecture or any website, optimizing for accessibility improves it for everyone. Similarly, optimizing the web experience in general to include older people and, and ad tech for older people to be more life affirming and welcoming would improve it for everyone. Um, this is going to hit in about 10 years, I anticipate, because just as I think uh, Gen Z is going to be uh, ahead of the civil liberties on privacy rights, I believe the millennials, which I would call the think piece generation, uh, because everything that they just realized, which other people already realized, but they're realizing it and writing think pieces about it, and they can flood the airways with it, they're going to realize ageism. They're going to be like, what kind of horrific virtual trap have we created for ourselves? The, the very waters we swam in that we were most at home in have become inhospitable, you know, nay hostile. And uh, they're going to uh, write a lot about that. So I can't wait. There's a way in which uh, always being ahead of myself, having a, a virtual self that's much older than me, but yet that I'm growing toward getting older in sort of some sort of horrific asymptote of, you know, decrepitude. Um, and, the, and the joke of it being that I did it to myself trying to hide and structure an experience that I could inhabit comfortably. It approximates the actual real life experience, especially as a woman, of getting older. I um, moved to a new neighborhood uh, some time ago, but right when I moved here, uh, I was walking down the street and um, there was a bodega with a bunch of guys drinking beer from, you know, with paper uh, on beer. And they were being kind of rowdy. So I thought, well, that looks like a hassle. So I crossed the street on my diagonal, I jaywalked. Um, I believe jaywalking is a, a self-preservation practice for women. The last thing you want is to get bunched up at an intersection and become the victim of a crime of opportunity. So um, I'm like jaywalking and I keep walking and now I'm opposite them. And I looked over and I thought, <laughs> What did you do? Why did you cross the street? These guys were not going to hassle you. At most, they might have been vaguely annoyed that you were blocking the view of someone they did want to hassle. So I started sort of chuckling to myself at this and I was like laughing and I was thinking of all the stupid things I did to avoid weird and bad and scary situations with men all the walking briskly and crossing the street, ducking into bodegas, the steely gaze, you know, the stone face that I had been so proud of. I had thought I was so good at it. I'm like, I'm a ninja, I'm stealth. I go here, there, I go everywhere. No one can see me. And instead I had wasted vast amounts of energy constructing essentially a carapace that had become welded onto my essential being in a way that I could not easily discard. And I'm laughing about this, like in a stupid, almost hysterical way. And then I look at the sidewalk in front of me and there's like water. And I realize I am not laughing. I'm crying. I am projectile crying. Like water is shooting out of my eyes, which I didn't know was a thing. And, and I was like, sobbing, not for me, for lost beauty, but for all the women, for all of us and the vast energy we've expended on these self-preservation projects that we're so proud of. And some women are great at the flirting and the hair toss and the little flirty comment to get out of a situation. 
you know, some of us duck and weave. And I just thought, what a, what a waste. What a terrible, terrible waste of human potential and energy. I thought, if I hadn't had to do this, who could I have become? Who could we have become? Thank you so much, Heather. At this point, I would like to invite Victoria and Sonia and Jack back for a very quick Q&A because we are quite short on time. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to scrap all the questions that I did have and instead just ask one question to the group, which is if you could reimagine the internet through your particular paper, what would that look like? What would it look like to have an internet governed by queer algorithms, if that were a thing? What would it look like to have an age inclusive internet? If you got to rewrite the internet, how would you rewrite it in about a 60 second answer? For me, no Facebook, ban Facebook, no Facebook, gone. And uh, never required for, to for, for, uh, furnish personal information. Uh, you know, anonymity is fully allowed. No data brokers can scrape and present my data to other people. Um, and uh, I know that right to be forgotten is extremely controversial, but right to be forgotten. So. Thank you. Jack or Sonia Victoria, who wants to go next? I can try thinking about what I talked about today. I guess my, my point would be around thinking about the pace of life on the internet and off the internet and thinking about how we can kind of design for different kind of paces of life and help people to manage the rate and scale at which content information and things come at you and how we can manage that better. Awesome. So I think that's a, that's a big and important question. Um, I would say reimagining the kinds of models um, and, and default assumptions that we Depart from um, and, and just allowing more spontaneity and trying to conceive of, I think privacy is, is clearly fundamental and crucial as Heather um, pointed out, but trying to conceive of collective rights um, and collective spaces of interaction. Um, yeah. I would say, um, allowing for the space of spontaneity and discovery and allowing for um, a person to have a fluid identity and not constantly being told who they are just because of what they looked at on the internet, you know, just before. Um, allowing for that kind of opportunity to be fluid um, and to be queer. Awesome. Thank you so much to all four of you for being here today. Thank you to everyone who's watching. Uh, the very last episode of Theorizing the Web Presents will be in two weeks on Wednesday, December 16th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. It is titled All Eyes on You, and we hope to see you then. Thank you so much. <laughs>